Amen. Would you open your Bibles, please, to Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10. Now, last week, we profiled this guy whose name was Cornelius. Cornelius lived in a place called Caesarea. Caesarea was a very, very large Greco-Roman city, mostly Roman, that was on the coast of what is today modern-day Israel, south of Haifa, north of Joppa. Haifa, of course, is on the coast, and if you know anything about the geography of the Middle East and Israel, you'd probably think of Haifa because it is a big port city on the coast. But it didn't work well as a port city back in the days of Jesus. Joppa, which is south of Caesarea, uh, again, we're talking 20 miles north to Haifa and about 40 miles south to Joppa. Joppa is this big outcropping of rock, a mountain that sort of sticks out into the water. And this is where, as I mentioned last time and have mentioned before several times when we went through Jonah, is where Jonah left from when he was trying to escape the Lord. But there was no safe harbor anywhere along the coast of Israel where if the, if the tide was up and the wind was blowing, it would blow your ship to pieces or dash it up on the rocks, depending on where you were in Haifa, which was not called Haifa then, in Joppa, which was called Joppa then, today it's Jaffa, and you'd be destroyed. So Herod built a port city where there was a very small outcropping of rock in this one particular area where there was a village. And he destroys the village, builds this amazing city, this huge port, a giant temple up on the hill to not Zeus, he does it to Augustus Caesar as part of the Caesar cult, where people in the empire were eventually required to burn a pinch of incense to Caesar once a year and say, Caesar is Lord, and Cornelius was one of those guys. Cornelius was a Roman centurion who lived in Caesarea right near this temple. We know that he did, even though the Bible doesn't tell us this, not even any other writing tells us this. But all of the important people, including Roman military officers, lived in the vicinity of the temple of Augustus there in Caesarea. So we know he lived near the temple. As we said last week, he was a man who, as a Roman centurion, a master, sergeant basically had to swear an oath to Caesar to protect the empire and be loyal to Caesar and essentially worship Caesar as a divine person not necessarily as a god but as among the gods they thought of Caesar as that way and with that in mind he is a Roman he's from Italy He's a Roman leader, a master sergeant. He has to worship Caesar once a year. Uh, he has sworn an oath to the Roman Empire to uphold that empire the way that any military person would swear an oath to protect and defend the United States of America and its constitution, the whole thing. Same sort of thing, except it was a deadly oath. You break the oath today, you might go to prison. You break the oath back then, they kill you on the spot. And this man is talking about Jesus, checking into Jesus, not really understanding Jesus, checking into the things of God. And here's the real problem. If he becomes a Christian, Jesus is Lord, not Caesar. See the problem? And this is where the power of the gospel really shines, as you'll see as we get further into this now. So he begins to believe in God. Remember, you move from region to region, you worship the gods of that region. Cornelius is an idol-worshiping pagan. But there in Caesarea, where he's stationed, which is in Judea, which is the region, they would, the Greeks called it Palestine, the Romans called it Judea, he begins to worship God. He is a what's called a God-fearer. All of this is in last week's message in fine detail, so I'm not going to go much further with it, except that he is a God-fearer. He begins to worship the God of the Jews, who we know as Lord God, King of the universe. He really doesn't know much about the God of the Jews except what they have told him. He's a Gentile. He's a Roman. The Jews don't like him. In fact, most Jews will hate him and not want to be around him because he's not only unkosher, he's part of the oppression problem. He's part of the tyranny. 
He's the problem, along with all the other Romans. And yet he's a good guy. And he's giving money to the poor. Well, the Jews did that, at least they were supposed to. It was called almsgiving. And that, by the way, falls under the category, number one under the category of works of righteousness in the Bible. What are works of righteousness? Doing good things. No, especially doing good things to people who do not have means, who are hurting, who are broke, who are sick. This is what he did. Cornelius is doing almsgiving, and he's praying. And the funny thing is, not funny, haha. -ha, he's praying at the same time the Jews pray every day because you find that as we read here, or we'll just read over it really quick, in the beginning of chapter 10, he's praying at the hour when the Jews traditionally prayed. But he's not a Jew. He can't become a Jew. Now, a lot of people do that. They become proselytes. Again, a Gentile convert to Judaism, but if you're a guy, first thing you have to do is you gotta get circumcised. The Romans thought that was brutality and barbarism. So they didn't do it. <laughs> oh yeah, we're not gonna take it any further than that. You also had to become kosher, you had to become a Sabbath keeper. Uh, and you had to get baptized, but this is a Jewish baptism. The baptism that they had, and I'll talk about this at the end because we're having a baptism this, uh, on the 4th of July, and I want to make sure that we're all on the same page with that. Some things you've heard before, but it's worth repeating. But baptism for a Gentile becoming a Jew was a very, very important act, which again, I'll explain when we're done here, when we're actually out of the text, because uh, I can go into much more detail on that. And that was a public declaration that you were becoming a Jew, which he couldn't do as a Roman. He wasn't allowed to do. They would kill him. They would execute him, drum him out of the court and execute him. It was really serious stuff. And yet, he's seeking the Lord, and the Lord is listening. And that's what our whole sermon was on last week, the whole message, that the people that seek God in our eyes can be the worst, most vile, oppressive, whatever type of people, but if they're seeking the Lord, the Lord's looking for them, and he's going to get them, and he might use you in order to bring Jesus to them. And that's what's going on here. So in chapter 10, verse 1, at Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion in what was known as the Italian regiment, which that tells you where he's from. He and his family, remember, they can't be married. Roman soldiers can't be married. Roman centurions can't be married. So his, his family is like a family description of a family, but it's his slaves, his servants, the people that are with him. If he, he might have some family members living in Caesarea. That's unlikely, but it is possible. So when it says family, it's the people that are with him that are close to him. And Roman centurions tended to be very close to their servants for a variety of reasons that we explained last week too. He and his family were devout and God-fearing. The whole family, why? Because the head of the family, what the head of the family does as far as worship goes, the rest of the family does. That was the rule back in those days. So if he decides he wanted to worship Zeus, everybody worships Zeus. If he decides he's going to worship this mysterious God of the Jews that they don't fully understand, they're going to do it too. That's how it worked back then. That's why this is stated this way. And so they were God-fearing too, and he gave generously. Generously is a key word, not just stingily or a penny here, a dime there. Generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. And one day about three in the afternoon, that's a time of Jewish prayer, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God. It's a vision. But he saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius. Cornelius stared up at him in fear. It's only a vision, but boy, has this got his attention. And he's a very rational Roman soldier. What is it, Lord, he asked. The angel answered, your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a remembrance before God. In other words, as worship to God. God recognizes that you're trying to worship him. You're doing the best you know how. Ooh, that's the way God works. I just love this part. Now, 
send men to Joppa and bring back a man named Simon who was called Peter. As we read before in chapter 9, Peter was going through these areas that were highly Hellenized. In other words, the Jews acted more like Greeks, probably couldn't read Hebrew at all, and he was healing people, raising people from the dead, and ends up at the house of Simon the Tanner in Joppa. Simon the Tanner is a very well-to-do fellow. He's got a big house, and he's constantly skinning animals and, and tanning the hides, and the place just reeks. It smells like roadkill. It doesn't smell like fresh leather. And it's also something that being around dead animal bodies makes you unclean ceremonially, and Peter is a very kosher Jew. So this is a big step for Peter to walk into a Hellenized area, heal or raise from the dead Hellenized people, and then go into a man's house who is a Jew. His name is Simon. He's Jewish. And stay in this house. They're tanning animals. This is unclean. But he's still staying with him. And we don't know what his relationship was with him in the originally anyway. But the house is by the sea. Tanner's houses were right on the beach practically because, of course, what they had to do demanded a lot of water. So um, it's right there on the ocean. And when the angel spoke to him, to Cornelius, uh, when the angel who spoke to him had gone, Cornelius called two of his servants and one of his military aides, who was a devout man, who he told them everything he ha that had happened and sent them to Joppa. So he's got two servants, and he's probably got a house full of servants, but two servants that are, interestingly enough, they're loyal to him. Now, when it says servants, it could mean just plain old slaves. But Cornelius was a fair man, a good guy. And whoever these servants were, he trusted them. They're not going to run off. And one of his military aides, well, that kind of keeps them from running off too. But off they go down to Joppa to get Peter. Do it right away. So verse 9, now the scene switches. These guys are on their way from Caesarea to get down to Joppa the next day. The guys are en route to Joppa and they're going to arrive at Joppa the next day. Peter is also on the roof of a house in Joppa. Good place to be when the house is really smelly because of what they do there. So about noon the following day, as they were approaching the city, approaching Joppa, here come the two servants and the, and the one military officer, Peter went up on the roof to pray. And he became hungry and wanted something to eat. And while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. Now, here's the deal. People spent a lot of time on the roofs of their house back at, houses back in those days. Uh, if you see sort of the Hollywood rendition of, of uh, ancient Middle Eastern houses, they tend to get them right. I mean, Hollywood gets so much wrong, but they tend to get these right, where you would have a house that looks like it's plastered, which it would be. It's plastered over rock. They would, I mean, Israel's cornered the market on rocks, folks. They're, you don't find a lot of mud brick buildings there. You do find some. So they would stack the rocks, and the, the Romans invented cement. They could mortar them together, and then they would cover them over with plaster, and then they would stick logs sticking out of the outside of the house that would sort of go diagonally up the side of the house. It's a stairway. You step on the logs, you walk up. The roof is either flat, sometimes it's domed, and when it's domed, it's to catch rain and divert it down into places where they could hold it in like cisterns that are dug into the ground, water tanks, because you need water there because it's very dry. But you love to spend time on the roof, especially in the hot summer months when it's blistering hot there. You would go up on the roof with your family and you'd sleep on the roof at night. When you're by the beach or when you're someplace where, of course, you know, daylight, it's very, very hot, you would also put up like a canopy if you could afford some sort of a tarp or a palm frond type of an arrangement where you've got palm branches on top, but you've got to anchor them down because you get wind coming off that ocean. It'll just blow it right off the roof. So it's got to be very, very secure, but it's a good, cool place to be, especially when it's really hot. You're by the ocean and the house you're staying at smells really, really bad. Peter goes up on the roof. Smart man. Around noon, that is not the typical time for the Jews to pray. That is lunchtime. They did eat around that time if they had food. They didn't always have food. And he goes up there, and he's not fasting. He just gets hungry. It's lunchtime. He became hungry. So normally at that time, he's praying, but he would probably go and seek out some food, and he falls into a trance. Now, this is brought on by the Lord. 
It's not brought on by his extreme hunger. It's not brought on by something he himself did. God does things that often we will say, I did this. Because I want to be very spiritual, you see. I did this. He didn't do anything. God put him into a trance. You know, when we talk about, like, revival, do you want revival in this nation? Wait a minute. Do you want revival in this nation? Yeah, amen. Then pray for it. Because we can sit down and say, now how can we facilitate revival breaking out? I have news for you. You can't. It's always brought by God, and sometimes when it's completely unexpected. But we can't make revival happen, so you pray for it, and you be ready for it. And if it just happens in you, let it happen in you. But it's something that God brings about. Same thing with visions and trances and these sorts of things. I don't know about trances. When I hear about trances, I think about, you know, like shamans and, and cultists going out there and going into some sort of a weird trance because they, they took some sort of a drug or something. And, and it, it kind of sounds really weird. But God does this. He, in order to be able to give a person sometimes a message that he intends to give, perhaps even very visually, He'll somehow put a person into a whole other state of mind. I don't want to say another state of being. That's weird. But just like a whole other state of mind where Peter, just the whole world around him just goes out of focus. The whole world around him just kind of disappears. And the only thing that he can see or perceive is what God is doing in front of him. How does that work? I have no idea. What is that like? I don't know. It never happened to me. Maybe it happened to you. God still does these things. Be aware of that. And remember, if you're not sure, well, what if it's not true? You can find out. You have a Bible. Compare notes. What was said, what happened versus what's in here. If it lines up, hey, pay attention. If it doesn't line up, just consider it like Ebenezer Scrooge did, an undigested bit of beef or a blot of mustard, and set it aside. Now, Peter goes into this trance. Verse 11. He saw heaven open. Whoa. That's a big vision. And something like a large sheet being let down to earth by its four corners. Now, let's picture what Peter's seeing. First of all, Peter is a very pious Jew. Yes, he's what we would call a Christian. However, he is essentially a follower of the Messiah, saved by the grace of Jesus Christ, his death on the cross. They're just starting to sort all of this out. It was so simple, but it was something that so much went against their grain. A person dies on the cross, they're shamed forever. Anybody that was associated with them was shamed forever. Peter is following Jesus, a crucified carpenter from Nazareth who rose from the dead. This is almost crazy to anybody back then. It's crazy to people today, too. It's just become a symbol more than actually a vivid reality. And here is Peter, this kosher Jew, and he's still Jewish. He's just following Jesus, the Messiah, God in human flesh. He's following him, but he's still a Jew, and he considers himself a really good Jew, a really good one. Now, he can't consider himself quite that good or he wouldn't be at Simon the Tanner's house. So we don't know really what's going on in his brain. But God is about to take the last shreds of his prejudice against Gentiles away from him. He's going to begin to eliminate it. Because remember I told you in the last two times that we spoke, God is tenderizing Peter to walk headlong into a Gentile's house and preach the gospel, something a pious Jew would never, never do, especially a Roman, never a Roman. Even though Jesus was willing to do it and Peter watched him do it in Jesus' ministry on earth, he was willing to go into a Roman centurion's house. And the Roman centurion said, no, it'll get you in trouble. I don't want you to get in trouble. I just want you to heal my servant, say the word, and you'll be healed. We talked about this last week too. But Peter... He's a problem because he would never do anything on kosher, would he? Well, he's sitting there in Simon the Tanner's roof. Are you kidding me? He just raised a, a, a Hellenized Jew who wasn't popular with the pious Jews from the dead. Prior to that, he heals a paralyzed Hellenized Jew. Something that, once again, pious Jews kept their distance from these less than kosher people. Peter sees this sheet come down from heaven opening in this vision. It's a vision. 
like Cornelius. It's really rare when you have two parallel visions happen, especially in the Bible. They just don't happen often at all, where two people get a vision that's somehow connected, and yet they have not been connected, at least not yet. Here comes the sheet. What's a sheet? What is this sheet that comes down from heaven? Well, we picture like a bed sheet, whatever. Do you think they had bed sheets back then? What would that be? They don't have bed sheets. They would never have anything like that. What is this? There's another word that sheet applies to. And those of you that like the water know what it is. A sail. And he's right there on the shore with... You know, it was a small port there, a very dangerous port to pull into, but there are ships at Joppa, and they run by wind, a sail. So he sees essentially a sail. Basically, that's what a sheet is. I used to actually be a sail maker a long time ago, before Kathy and I were even ever together. And doing that, of course, the sail was called the main sheet. That was it. That's what it was. And it's been known as that for thousands of years. So he sees something like a large sheet, like a sail, being let down to the earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals. Now listen to this list. Four-footed animals is okay. But wait, what kind of four-footed animals? As well as reptiles of the earth, ooh, lizards, and birds of the air, certain types of birds. And then a voice told him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. What kind of animals are these that he's seeing, this big variety, this little mini zoo that comes down? Peter tells us very clearly, kill and eat, Peter. You want lunch? Kill it and eat it. Now you say, well, that's not the way we do things around here. No, it's the way they did things there. If you wanted to eat lunch, you didn't go down to the fridge and say, where's the lunch meat? You went out and caught something, shot something with an arrow or trapped something, and then you killed it and you prepared it and you ate it. This is what you did. And usually if you were a guy, you gave it to the woman of the house and she did it for you while you sat around and drank coffee and talked politics with somebody else. <laughs> Not much has changed. These animals are completely unkosher. And we know this because Peter says in verse 14, Surely not, Lord. Peter replied, I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. These are unclean animals. They're unkosher. Lizards, first of all, unkosher. Certain types of birds, certain types of four-footed animals, whatever he's seeing there, he knows as a good, pious Jew, even though he is a Christian, he's not supposed to eat this stuff as a Jew. It's in the laws of Moses. And, of course, Peter says, no way, I'm not going to do this. You know, Lord, I have never done such a thing. As if God is testing him. God isn't testing him in the sense like, I want to test you. You're really hungry right now. Let's see if you'll break God's law and actually eat unkosher stuff. And I'm sure he's thinking, no, 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 I'm a good Jew. I will never do that. See, it's a test, he thinks. Instead, what God is saying is, you're missing the point, Peter. That's not what I'm telling you, and that's not what we're doing here. It's not about the kosherness of the animals for you. In fact, Jesus took care of this a while back. It, it, over in Mark chapter 7, verse 14, you can turn there if you like to, just keep your finger here in Acts. But Mark chapter 7, verse 14, Jesus, it says again, called to the crowd, called the crowd to him and said, listen to me, everyone, and understand this. Nothing outside a man can make him unclean by going into him. Food doesn't make your heart bad. I'm not talking physically, you know this. Doesn't make you a more sinful person, an unpious or even an unkosher person. This is very interesting coming from the ultimate Jew, Jesus. King of kings, Lord of lords, creator of the universe, but still the ultimate Jew walking this earth. He's showing Jews how to be Jews when he walks around as a Jew. That's what's happening. And he says, nothing, nothing outside a man makes him unclean by going into him. Rather, it's what comes out of a man that makes him unclean. And please forgive me, I'm not trying to be crude here, but it's not going to the bathroom that he's talking about. He's talking about what comes out of the heart. He said, after he left the crowd, verse 17, and entered the house, his disciples asked him about this parable. 
<laughs> he said, Jesus says, why are you so dull? You, you think, you, you're dense. Don't you see that nothing that enters a man from the outside can make him unclean? For it doesn't, for if it, for it doesn't go into his heart, but into his stomach, and then out of his body. And then Mark, in parentheses here, says a remarkable thing. And a very pious Jew would hit the roof. But Mark wrote this long after Jesus rose from the dead, after the day of Pentecost. Here he says in parentheses, in saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. The God of the universe who established the kosher laws just said, I want you to understand what I meant by that. Jesus goes on, verse 20, he says, what comes out of a man is what makes him unclean. For within, for from within, out of a man's hearts come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. It's quite a list. All these evils come from inside and make a man unclean. Not about the food. And, but Mark's little remark there. Peter must not have been thinking about that, or Mark understood it later. Either way, Peter's still saying, I'm a kosher Jew. Now, is it wrong for a Jewish person today who acknowledges Jesus as Lord, Savior, and Messiah? Is it wrong for a Jewish person to stay kosher? No. no. There's nothing wrong with that at all. As long as they're not depending on it for salvation either to get it or to keep it, or even to maintain it. It's okay, because Jewish people today who acknowledge Jesus as Lord, Savior, and Messiah can now look at all the things in the Bible, the Old Testament, Moses, and all the things he said, and they can see Jesus in every ceremony, every sacrifice, every celebration, every feast, every piece of food, because it all points to Jesus. Paul even said so. These were all shadows of the reality that has come. So is it wrong? No. It is wrong, however, to say to the Gentiles, you must do these things too. Because when we get to Acts chapter 15, you'll see very clearly that none of these things were required by the Gentiles, required of the Gentiles, rather, by God. Very, very important. And I say this as a warning because there are movements out there, there are always things blowing through churches and movements that are Christian where they get very popular in churches. The Hebrew Roots Movement, the Jewish Roots Movement, these sorts of things, calling them by name, that Gentiles should also go back to their Hebrew Roots or their Jewish Roots and keep the Sabbath and keep kosher and don't call Jesus Jesus, call him Yeshua because that's how you pronounce his name in Hebrew and all of these different things. And Christians find themselves wrapped up in a bondage that God never intended for them to be. Look at the things and see Jesus. Look at these things and learn of Jesus. Jesus. To participate in a Jewish feast sometime and see Jesus popping out of that feast because it all pointed to him. But to practice it because you must do it as a Christian is a big mistake. And Jesus even points that out while he walked the earth, even about kosher food, where by this, Jesus declared all foods clean. Interesting. You get in the picture here? So, Peter, very pious Jew, he keeps the Sabbath. He, he believes in, of course, strongly in things like circumcision and all of these different things, and especially kosher food, and God's testing him, of course. He's testing me to see that I'll really be a good pious Jew, perhaps because he'd just been hanging with the less than kosher Jews out there, right? He's been with the, the, the Hellenized Jews. He's staying at the house of Simon the Tanner. He sees this, this sail-like cloth come down. Here's all these unkosher animals. 
animals. And maybe Peter is thinking, and I say maybe because it's very possible, that what he's thinking is, I've been with all these unkosher people, and now God is testing me. Why? Because I have been with unkosher people. And maybe God is saying, Peter, you've fallen off the wagon. Get back on. You've fallen off the horse. Get back on. You need to be more pious. No, Lord, I have never touched anything like this that's unclean. Uh, saying no, Lord, in the same statement is a very, very dangerous thing. The voice spoke to him a second time. Verse 15 in Acts. We're back in Acts now. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. Now, this happened three times, and immediately the sheet was taken back up to heaven. Now, Peter is going to elaborate on this two more times, and we're going to see more details as he elaborates on this. But this happens three times. Sheet comes down, Peter sees the animals, God says, kill and eat. He goes, no, Lord, I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. He's not getting it. But by the third time, I think Peter's beginning to realize God is talking about something different than what I'm thinking about. And here's what happens next. While Peter was wondering about the meaning of the vision, this is verse 17, the men sent by Cornelius found out where Simon's house was and stopped at the gate, literally the outer gate. This tells us that Simon's house was big because a house that has an outer gate means that it's got an enclosure around it and then a compound on the inside. Simon's got a big house. Simon's a rich guy. They called out asking if Simon, who was known as Peter, was staying there. This is how, of course, you come to the door. You just you ask around town. I'm looking for Simon the Tanner. I'm looking for a guy named Simon Peter. Where is he? People are saying, well, he's down that way somewhere, and they get closer and closer. But they don't have those little, you know, Mr. Google Maps things to find things by, right? So they, go, he, they finally get down there starting shouting, I'm looking for Simon Peter. I'm looking for Simon Peter. I have a message. And, of course, he's there shouting and and. Uh, verse 19, while Peter was still thinking about the vision, he's still up there going, what just happened? What was that all about? He hasn't quite figured it out, but he realizes, as I said, that what he was originally thinking is not the message God's trying to get through to him. Here comes the message. It suddenly penetrates. While he was thinking about the vision, the Spirit said to him, Simon, three men are looking for you. So get up and go downstairs. Do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. Who are these guys? They're servants of a Roman centurion. And one of them is a Roman soldier. Now, if a Roman soldier comes asking for you and you're a Jew, especially a Jew that had been persecuted, by other Jews, by the way. That was happening because a lot of the Jewish leadership were persecuting the other Jews who claimed Jesus as the Messiah. But the Romans were the one who hung Jesus on the cross 10 years before this event happens. This is 10 years later. And a Roman soldier shows up. God's got to say, now, Peter, don't be afraid to go with him. Because if God says, don't be afraid, you know what that means, don't you? It means you're afraid. He's not lying to you. He says, just don't be afraid, Peter. Go with them. These guys are not just unkosher. They're way over on the other side of the line. They're not like less than kosher Jews or unkosher Jews like Simon the Tanner would be an unkosher Jew because he's killing animals, touching dead animals all the time. He lives in an unkosher state. These guys are Gentiles. And they belong to a Roman centurion who's one of the oppressors. And they're from Caesarea. Caesarea is a pagan city. Go with them. Don't be afraid. Oh. So verse 21. Peter went down and said to the men, I'm the one you're looking for. Why have you come? I wonder if he was kind of taking a you know, big gulp at that time. Um, I'm the one you're looking for. What's going to happen? <laughs> Why have you come? The men replied, verse 22, We have come from Cornelius the centurion. 
He is a righteous, that means, once again, works of righteousness. He is giving to the poor, helping support the poor, generously, helping others. That's works of righteousness. We do works of righteousness. At least we're supposed to. Not because we need to get saved by them. We can't be saved by them. Not because they maintain our salvation. They don't maintain our salvation. They don't let us keep our salvation. They are because we follow Jesus, we do these works of righteousness with whatever means God has given you. That's a whole other sermon, but I want to make sure that's very clear. We have come from Cornelius the centurion. We're coming from a Roman. Not kosher. He is a righteous and God-fearing man. Oh, a God-fearer, but he's still a Roman. That means that if he's a righteous and God-fearing man, he's not been baptized as a proselyte, not a Christian, a proselyte. Remember, there was a baptism process with that. Again, I'll explain that later. But he's also not circumcised. He doesn't keep kosher, kosher but he is righteous. He's doing good works, and he is fearing God. In other words, he has a reverence for God. You're God, Peter, the God. And they added this, which was really cool, who is respected by all the Jewish people. Caesarea is a pagan city, but Jews live there. Wherever you had pagan cities, all throughout the land in those days, and you had lots of them, Jews still lived in the cities. They were your less than kosher Jews, but they did live there. A holy angel told him, not a demon, not some sort of an apparition, let's be specific, a holy angel, an angel from God, in other words, told him to come, to have you come to his house. Oh, stop right there. Peter's probably going, oh, wow. A Roman wants me to come into his house. I've never done that before. I would never do such things. That's unkosher. This person is, is an unkosher person. I, I, I would never go into a Roman's house. Now, I want to stop right there for a second. We're going through this quite rapidly, aren't we? Isn't this a miracle? <laughs> now, here's the thing. If you're a Jew and you are a, you're not like a, you know, convenient, out of convenience Jew. You actually are keeping God's law and you're trying to stay as kosher as you can. Why wouldn't you go into a Gentile's house and spend time with the Gentile and eat and drink with him? And the reason is actually very simple. Paul even addresses this in Corinthians. You see, when you go into a Gentile's house in those days, they're going to exercise hospitality with you. They're going to offer you food. They're going to offer you drink. You have to ask the question, where'd they get it? They run down to Holiday and pick something up for you? Did they go to Subway and get a sandwich? I'm not plugging Subway. It's just, you know, you get the idea, right? No. They had to get their meat somewhere. Where'd they get it? the temple, not God's temple, pagan temple, because they sacrificed the animals there, and they didn't do very often whole burnt offerings like they did at the Jewish temple. They did a lot of those. They would take the meat, and then they would sell it to the butcher, and the butcher would sell it to the general population. That's how they did it. Or if you needed meat right now, go to the temple. You offer a guy some money for his latest sacrifice, take it home, cook it up. The thing is, if you ate the meat of an animal sacrificed to a pagan god, that was considered worship of an idol because that's how they worshiped idols. You ate the meat that was sacrificed to the god, you are participating in idol worship. We say, well, you know, what about a drink of wine? Wine was offered as worship to pagan gods. Now, you, you give me this funny look here, and it's, of course, legitimate because you say, but they did that at the Jewish temple. Yes, they did. It was the same sort of thing. When you sacrificed at the temple in Jerusalem, or even at the tabernacle much earlier, and you did the sacrifice at the altar, unless you were consecrating something holy to God, your life, saying, God, I want this to represent my life completely consumed by you, you'd burn the whole sacrifice to ashes. But if you were doing something like a fellowship offering, for instance, what does that mean? You are fellowshipping with God, 
and with the people around you, the people next to you. Well, how do you do that? Sacrifice the animal, put it on the altar, roast it, pull it off, eat it. It's a barbecue. These people loved it. You say, man, temples must have smelled really bad. They smelled like barbecues. No, I'm serious. They smelled like barbecues. It was really delicious to be around a temple. And the Jews did the same thing. You were actually, when you ate like a lamb or a goat that was sacrificed to the Lord, even an oxen, and you had all the people sit around and eat it, you were eating not just with each other, you were eating with God. You were having a feast with him because you gave it to him, and now he says, now you eat that. You know, I'm spirit. I'm not going to eat that. I'm just, you eat that. But you're with me. And it was cool. Well, the pagans kind of had the same thing going. And the Jews knew it because the similarities were there. And so they would never go into a pagan's house and eat food because they're joining themselves to an idol because they know where the food had to have come from. Now, Paul solved that problem with the Corinthians in a very interesting way where he said, look, when you enter somebody's house and they put meat in front of you, don't ask where it came from. This is the first part of don't ask, don't tell. <laughs> don't ask where it came from. Just eat the food for all food that is received with thanksgiving is clean. He didn't say bless the food. He said receive it with thanksgiving. It's clean. But if they tell you this food was offered to an idol, in other words, we sacrificed, this was sacrificed to Zeus. Isn't that cool? He said, don't eat it for your conscience sake and theirs. Don't eat it if you know it was part of idol worship. Otherwise, who cares? Listen, you walk into a, a Chinese restaurant or an Indian restaurant. Don't go around asking, did you dedicate this food to Buddha or did you dedicate this food to some Hindu god? Paul said, don't ask. Enjoy the food. If they come up to you and say, hey, we gave this to Buddha this morning or something, like, okay, I'm, I'm not going to eat it. Because I don't want to participate in idol worship because that's not what I do. I worship the God. I don't worship a fake God. So it's the first instance, again, I'm not trying to be funny here, but of don't ask, don't tell. Peter's got to go into a Roman's house, and he knows where that food's coming from, and he knows Caesarea because there's that temple up on the hill. Yeah, they would sacrifice animals there too, not just pinches of incense. It's a temple to Augustus, and there are other pagan temples in the vicinity because this is a hotbed of Roman and Greek activity in there. He would never do it. And suddenly it sinks in. Peter, don't call unclean that which I have called clean. Go with them. God is calling Roman Gentile soldiers idol worshipers, even though he's a God-fearer, clean? Yeah. Go with him. So, verse 23. Then Peter invited the men into the house to be his guests. To be his guests. Now, Peter, this is not Peter's house. But if he invites them into the house, he is responsible for hospitality. These men are not kosher. Unless the servants were conscripted Jews, which they probably aren't, they could be. They could be like sort of leftover Canaanites or Phoenicians or something. We don't know. But there is a Roman soldier among them, and they inv he invites these guys who are with Rome, with Rome, a soldier from Rome, come into my house and I will give you food and drink inside of a Jewish house. Wow, God broke through. He brought people into his house that no pious Jew would ever invite into their house. Not those guys. They might do somebody else that's maybe similar. You could conceivably invite a Samaritan in, but you know, remember the woman at the well. Samaritan woman, Jesus, who she perceives as a rabbi and a very strong Jewish teacher. She doesn't really know that he's the Messiah. That, she, that John 
points out when Jesus asked her for a drink and the woman says to Jesus, who are you, a Jew, asking me, a Samaritan woman, for a drink? John puts in parentheses there, for Samaritans have nothing to do with, or do not associate with Jews, and Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Your Bible may say has nothing to do with, it's the same thing. But when it says has nothing to do with, it's not like they're going, I have nothing to do with you. When it says they do not associate, it literally means, in their minds, they do not eat or drink with them. That was what was so outrageous about Jesus asking the Samaritan woman for a drink. Because they don't eat or drink with them. Because why? The Jews believed that the Samaritans were idol worshipers. Even though they claimed to be worshiping the same God, they were doing it wrong. And it wasn't quite the same God. He was a half a degree off, but that's enough. So we don't eat with them. Why? Because we're participating in their worship somehow. But conceivably, they could invite them because they were pretty close to Judaism. But not Romans, not these Gentiles. And what does Peter do? Come in, eat and drink. And now he's their host. And they're partaking of his hospitality. This moment right here, right now, it doesn't look like much. It should be sending off fireworks all over the world. This is never done. And as far as anybody knows, with a kosher Jew, especially a guy like Peter, this has never been done. It might be the first time ever. The next day, oh, one more thing. Being Romans, they just could have burst in. This is what they do, you know. Hey, we're here, we're coming in. Because that they bulldoze right through houses because they knew they had the upper hand. What are you going to do to them? They stayed outside and they called. He invited them in. I mean, add it all up. This is God working, saying, bring them in. It's okay. But they're idol-worshiping pagans. They shouldn't be in a house. God's working on them or they wouldn't be there in the first place. So, the next day, Peter started out with them. They spend the night. Unheard of. Peter starts out with them the next day. And some brothers from Joppa went along. We find out in the next chapter there were six of them. Brothers, these are Christians. Brothers, these are Jews. They might be Hellenized, they might not be Hellenized, but either way, they are Jews. And they go with Peter. Peter takes them along. For protection, no, as witnesses. Because what's happening right now is once again unheard of. Peter could be thinking, I could really be open up to a lot of scandal here. I better bring some guys along with me to make sure that they know this is a work of God, however it turns out, because he didn't know where that was going either. He's just going up to a centurion's house. So these guys go along. Verse 24. The following day... He arrived in Caesarea. Caesarea is about 30, depending on which route you take, 30 to 40 miles north. Uh, so it's a long walk, and that means they have to spend the night along the way, and they do, because they're obviously on foot. They're not on horseback. It takes a while to get up there. The following day, he arrived in Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them. He's ready and had called together his relatives and close friends. Once again, relatives would not have traveled with a Roman soldier anywhere. Are there relatives in the area? It's possible. Otherwise, this simply means the people that he had around them, as well as his close friends. Who are those? Probably other Roman officials. Could be merchants or whatever people that he had been friends with. We don't know. And as Peter entered the house... All right, we have to stop there. I don't mean stop the sermon, but we have to stop the narrative right there. As Peter entered the house. If you were inclined to write or mark in your Bible, mark that. If you're not, don't. But if you're inclined, make a note of it. Because that phrase... Peter entered the house. Everything in the world changed right there. Everything. Last week, there was 
a, unfortunately, a very minor celebration of one of the greatest events in the history of humanity. And it almost went by unnoticed. It was the 50th anniversary of the moon landing when Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin put on their suits, stepped outside of the lunar module, went down a little ladder, and put his foot on the ground and left an imprint on another planet. We don't think of the moon as another planet, but that's exactly what it is. We are being circled by another planet. First time it's ever happened. And Neil Armstrong said something he didn't really mean to say because he left out one word, just the word, the letter A. But what he said is that's one small step for man, and what he meant to say was one small step for a man. He corrected it, it's on the record. What, but it's one giant leap for mankind. And I remember watching it live on TV. And I went, wow. But I didn't break out into goosebumps until probably a couple of decades later when I went back and thought about it again and realized what a moment that was. How in the world did we pull that off? We did. But it's amazing the amount of work, the hundreds of thousands of people, all the math, all the science, all the engineering that went in to get two human beings which are just like you, with different skills and, you know, what have you, but just like you, and put them on another planet and bring them home safely. Unbelievable. One small step. And at that moment, the world changed. How did it change? Well, really politically nothing changed. Nothing changed in my house. I watched it on TV. The only thing that changed in my house is my dad bought a color TV for the moment and it was in black and white. <laughs> that changed, but that was about it. But what Peter did was far greater. One giant leap for mankind and the whole history of the world. It was the moment where a kosher Jew who God said, don't look down on those who are not kosher. Don't look down on those who are not even Jews. They're not even with you like you are of you. Don't look down on them. They want to know me. You step into their house. I'd never do that, Peter. Let's have a little lesson here. And God gave him the lesson, and he got it. Because that's the moment that began, as Peter begins to preach to them, as we'll read next week. He begins to preach to them, what happened? What am I doing here? He's as amazed as they are. In fact, he's not really even answering Cornelius' question as you read on. Please read on. Read ahead. I want to keep you in suspense. The message is great. Let's see what God teaches you. But he's so staggered by being there, he has to tell the story of how he got there. What God had to do. The sheep, the animals, all of this, and kosher and everything. And God interrupts him. And the Holy Spirit falls on Cornelius and every other Gentile in that room. And Peter, as we'll see next time, next week, suddenly realizes salvation from and through Jesus Christ is for anyone, anywhere, from any background from any type. This is not a politically correct statement. This, yes, amen. Jesus is for everyone. It's just that not everyone will receive him, but he is for everyone. And Peter didn't really know that until then. The way I see that big step thing is this. 
it, it's kind of a peculiar thing, and I, I get to I get to share this when I'm when I'm in uh, Israel and when we're in Caesarea, we actually go to the general area of Cornelius's house. Nobody knows where it was. Someday, as I mentioned last week, somebody might dig up a foundation of a house and find some, some ancient first century, second century Christian graffiti written on a piece of plaster somewhere like we came here as a pilgrimage because this was Cornelius' house. This is how they find these things, believe it or not, graffiti. You know, we think we got graffiti all over the place. It's terrible. They've had graffiti since the beginning. Adam probably carved Adam plus Eve on a tree, you know. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm not trying to be irreverent here. But you get the idea. But anyway, we don't know where it was, but, but the way that I picture this when I'm there in Caesarea and I get to talk with the people about it is you kind of, and forgive me, but I, I've seen enough movies and TV to think if I were a director and I were making a movie of this moment, what it would look like. And you would have Peter and the six guys and the three other guys and one of them a Roman soldier is the Roman soldier dressed like a soldier? Very likely. He's not to be out of uniform, <coughs> but what are his accoutrements at this time? Because he comes in peace, not in war? Not really sure. But he's got to protect himself because he's a target of the Jews. They hate him. So he looks like a soldier he's protected, at least to a certain extent. And Peter with the soldier, the two servants, and here are the six other Jews with Peter. And Peter is point man. And these three other guys are leading him to Cornelius' house, followed by these other six people, because Peter's the man in charge. Let him be out there. And he walks up to Cornelius' house, and Cornelius is waiting for him, a Roman centurion in a house full of Roman pagans. And Cornelius, in whatever manner he did, says, come in. Peter, outside the door of the house or the gate to the compound, same thing, kicks his sandals off because he would never wear his shoes into the house. The camera comes in on Peter's back as he's moving towards the gate. And the camera pans back as Peter is moving forward. And then you can see all the people behind him. You see the people in front of him, including the Roman soldier and the servants, but the servants only holding the door open. You see, framed in front of Peter, there's a Roman centurion in all his regalia standing inside that doorway. And he's got his hands out to welcome him, his right hand especially. And Peter moves towards the doorway. The camera pans in on Peter's feet from the side. You see him reach down and undo the thongs of his sandal and kick his sandals off and push them aside with his foot. And then you see Peter's face. He looks down at the threshold. He looks up at Cornelius. The camera goes down by his feet, and you see it from the side, his feet. And in slow motion, you see one foot, his right foot, leave the ground very slowly and step over that stone bar that would be the threshold of the gate. And his foot goes down very, very slowly on the inside of that threshold bar and a little puff of dust comes up as his foot lands on the ground. That moment, you have a completely different world. Everything, everything changed. A kosher Jew just brought the message of Jesus, which he didn't know was for everyone, to the rest of the world to a Roman centurion's house in Caesarea. Little bitty steps, that's one small step for a Peter. And it's the biggest leap for mankind short of the cross of Christ. Imagine these little steps, little steps. What are a little step? How about this? Something we already covered in here, Philip meeting an Ethiopian eunuch. He was a proselyte. He was not a Gentile who was living as a Gentile or an idol-worshiping pagan. He was a convert to Judaism. He had been circumcised, he kept all the laws, he was kosher, all of that. But Peter runs up to him and takes one step towards him and the guy says, I don't know what I'm reading. Suddenly the gospel goes into Africa and begins to spread out. In Africa, in Africa! 
How about the Apostle Paul in Alexandria Troas, where he gets a vision of a Macedonian man that actually turned out to be a Macedonian woman. And the Macedonian man is distressed saying, come over here. Up until then, the gospel had been confined to Asia and to Africa because of Philip in Africa and the eunuch. And suddenly Paul says, we gotta go. And Paul in Alexandria Troas walks out with his disciples onto a dock, finds a guy who's got a boat, gives him some money, who's heading off in the direction he needs to go. It turns out he's heading past Samothrace and he's going to a place called Neapolis, which is modern day Kavala. If you've ever taken a Mediterranean cruise in the Aegean, you probably ended up there for a short time because a lot of cruise ships pop into there. Today, it's known as Kavala. Back then it was, it was Neapolis. And three days on that ship, with the wind to their backs, he ends up in Neapolis, walks inland eight miles to a place called Philippi, looks for a synagogue. There ain't one. There's not enough Jews in the town. But there are some Jewish women washing their clothes down by the water, which is where they would have worship services if they didn't have a synagogue because there weren't enough men to do it. And he leads Lydia to Christ. And the next thing you know, you got a church in Philippi. But it's the first church first fellowship of Christians in Europe. That's the beginning of Christianity in Europe. Before then, didn't go there. One small step. I picture the same thing, you know, zooming in on the feet and all of that. Paul stepping off of the dock onto the boat. And the moment his foot hits that boat, world changes once again. And we're here because of that. Martin Luther in Rome, when he's beginning to question all the Catholic dogma that keeps people out of heaven rather than helping them in, and he realizes that the just shall live by faith, and he's crawling up on a flight of stairs over by San Giovanni in Laterno, one of the great four basilicas in Rome, and they've got this holy flight of stairs that they say Jesus walked up and down on with Pontius Pilate, which he didn't, but, but it's you know sort of a holy relic, and he says, no, it just occurs to him, the just shall live by faith. My knees are bleeding on these stairs. He stands up and walks down and the reformation begins. It didn't start with the with the the uh, the 90 theses that he's nailed to the door in Wittenberg. It started with the thought that he had, no, it's by faith, not by works that I'm saved. One step off those stairs and the world changes again because then he starts writing these things down and then it goes into high gear and suddenly the Protestant church is born. And any time that a person follows Jesus, that's a little tiny step. But stepping over that threshold, when you said, I will follow Jesus, you took a little step. Maybe you came down at an altar call. Maybe you went up to the cross to pray with people. Maybe you were in your room. Maybe you were in a car. Maybe you were like C.S. Lewis on a bicycle where he started his bicycle journey as an atheist and ended up as a Christian. And never explained how. But you took one small step. How important was that step for you? Hell to heaven, life, death to life, lostness to salvation, one step, just one little step. What about your steps? I mean, think about Peter stepping over that threshold. Think about Paul stepping onto that boat. When God commands you, take a step. Step of faith, step towards somebody else, a step into somebody else's life of whose life you strongly disapprove. And you take that small step. The world can change, folks. Who was Peter? Well, he was Peter. He was Peter the Rock, yeah, and he sank too. Remember that. Who are you? Who am I? And yet God uses the smallest things and the smallest people to do the biggest things on this earth. Not because we're great, because he is. Not because we're good at it, because we are brought alongside of him by his grace. So that we could be blessed when we see what happens through our little bitty steps. You say, what are you leading up to? Let me just say this. 
How big of a step do you consider it? How big of a step was it to you for that person who approached you with the gospel for the very first time and you received it? That was the step that changed your life and changed your situation for eternity. That was a big step. How big are the steps you take towards other people? How big are those steps when you walk into somebody else's life? It's huge. If it doesn't change the whole world, at least it will change theirs. How small of a thing was it that someone took the time to lead you to Jesus? In fact, what steps can you take here, today, now? We'll call that a step in the right direction. That's why we follow, we follow Jesus wherever he goes because you never know what he'll do because of it. And when you look at this passage of scripture, you realize that Peter was just plain old Peter being Peter. And he was good at it. What did God do through him? We're reading about it today and you're sitting here today because he obeyed the Lord and took the step. One step, you say, well, it was a long journey to Caesarea. Yeah, but it was one step that went from a kosher Jew into an idol-worshiping pagan's house to lead that household to Christ, which we'll talk more about next week. Thank you, Lord, for taking the step to come to us. Lord Jesus, to lay aside all your glory to become a man. Taking the step towards the cross and dying for us. Taking the step out of the tomb and leading the way to resurrection, for you are risen. Lord, increase our faith. We are so bad at following you sometimes, sometimes so scared. Sometimes we think the steps that you want us to take are irrelevant or that can be ignored at our convenience. And we are so guilty, so many of us in so many ways, of not truly following you step by step. Lord, let every step we take be a big one, even when we don't see it, even when we don't know it. I don't even know if Peter thought of it that way. But Lord, we're here because of that. Help us to know that every step you have us take when we follow you can change the world. In Jesus' name, amen.